The Book of Recollections, Episode 27, Uncaged, by Dysylvania. Well, 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 my dear reader, you're back, and so am I, your faithful Book of Recollections, ready to deliver another tale in our ongoing saga. This episode has it all. Golden orcs, burning sands, starry spirits, and, of course, a little bit of mm, rough diplomacy. Intrigued? Of course you are. Let's begin. Back to the city of Ramidava, one of the two great capitals of the Red Kingdom, a realm scorching under the eternal and holy sun of Lumino. Magic was forbidden and speaking of the Hebdomads was like asking for the heavens to strike you down. But there they stood, our intrepid heroes, Pax, Isari, Shaklashak, looking in awe at the cage in the throne room, which housed none other than Tulrock, their orcish companion. Only Tulrock was painted thick with gold and fooling absolutely no one with his disguise as a golden orc. Oh dear Tulrock, you can dress a goliath up in gold, but he'll never sparkle like the real thing. In the royal court of the Red King Zalmoxi, a ruler both ancient and suspicious, Pax and Isari attempted to negotiate Tulrock's release. With the king's skeptical gaze fixed on them, they wove tale of their intentions and need to bring Tulrock into their care. After much back and forth, and with the promise of a meeting the following morning, King Zalmoxie relented. The golden orc Goliath would be released for now. But the Red King's sharp eyes warned them that he wasn't fooled by half-baked tales or gilded deceptions. Meanwhile, in another part of the Red Kingdom, Adam Hebdom prepared to undertake a ritual, a dangerous one no less. With guidance from his new companion, the captivating Genasi Teleftos, Adam sought to commune with his celestial ancestor. Infatuation simmered between them, even as Adam weighted the risks. He was willing to lose his material life if it meant answers. Star reading revealed the vizier card, symbolic of his forefather, the original Hebdom. Adam knew the ritual must be done under the auspicious evening skies constellations and, without hesitation, accepted the risks of this communion that his friends knew nothing of. Back in the city, Pax Isari, Shaq and Tulrock attempted to navigate Ramidava's hostile streets. Here, any mention of magic or hint of hebdomatic power were thought to trigger natural disasters, at least according to the populace belief who would whisper both fearfully and menacingly about the legion of the unseen hand coming to get them. A stroll through this desert kingdom, my dear reader, was no walk in the park for these heretics to its ways. Try a sprint through a sandstorm with meteors raining down on your heels. As they scavenged for supplies, Isari, her celestial aura blazing, attracted the attention of a group of Luminites, zealots whose eyes gleamed with unearthly devotion. They pleaded for her to grant them the gift of incineration, a path to ascension, or so they believed. But none of them ascended, and with each failed plea, Isari's heart grew heavy at the loss of life. She was not the savior they had hoped for, 
and the zealot's unmet desire for release lingered like a shadow over her. Elsewhere, night descended and Adam's ritual began. With Telephtos by his side, he communed with his ancestor, a being now among the celestials. The power was immense, the revelation monumental, but the ritual drained his mortal body beyond recovery. When Adam's spirit returned, his body was no more. Adam Hebdom was purged by fire and had become a celestial spirit. His mortal form left behind, his light now intangible, radiant and without flesh. And wouldn't you know it, this isn't even the first spectral hebdom to ascend in the Red Kingdom. <laughs> you didn't see that one coming, did you? Later that evening, the party, without Adam, reunited once more, finding lodging in a tavern. The city of Ramidava, so foreign and unforgiving, loomed around them. Hushed conversations revealed a dawning suspicion. The troubles plaguing Ramidava and Greenspring were disturbingly alike, perhaps the work of a single dark force, even if Ramidavians blamed Greenspring magic. Isari ascended to the celestial realm that night, searching for clarity. She discovered hints that both kingdoms, red and green, were possibly marked by the same malevolent hand, a dark power poised to consume them. She searched for Adam as well, finding his presence only towards the arrival of the sun on the clear night sky. Downstairs in the dim tavern, an unlikely interruption came in the form of two luminite pickpockets, Emma and Amma, twins sharing a single body with two heads. The Red Kingdom hosted plenty of humans with extra appendices, showing the favor that Lumino bestowed upon mankind. The willy pair attempted to pilfer Tulrock's belongings, but were swiftly caught. The twins, whose curiosity about magic was insatiable, struck a tentative truce with the party, hosting them for the night to regain their favor. The twins confessed they hoped that magic, though taboo in the Red Kingdom, might someday separate them into two bodies, granting them independence at last. The next morning brought a strange reunion. Adam's spirit appeared with Isari before his friends, a radiant figure of light, nearly transparent, no longer bound to his material form. For the nocturnals, this sight was tragic. They mourned the Adam they once knew, seeing him as a ghost, a friend lost to death. But for the Luminites, this was a sacred moment, a sign of ascension. Adam, the newly ascended spirit, revealed that the Red Kingdom's threats stemmed indeed not from Greenspring, but likely from within. A dark force festering in one of their own settlements, or Jatuzas as they would call them. With their spectral friend in tow, the group returned to the court of King Zalmoxi. Tensions flared. Zalmoxi was wary of Greenspring's King Evander and reluctant to trust Pax and his retinue. But Adam and Isari's discoveries tipped the scales. If they could prove that the threat came from within the Red Kingdom itself, perhaps war with Greenspring could be avoided. Zalmox's conditions were clear. If they could trace the source of these disasters to Sarmisegetuza itself, he would consider peace. And so, our brave adventurers packed their sparse supplies. They had nothing but the scarce offerings from the populace given only out of respect for Isari's celestial status. Armed with determination and a hint of hope, 
they prepared to venture deeper into the Red Kingdom's unforgiving sands. Ooh, what lies in wait for them there? And how long before the forces punishing magic, hebdomatic or otherwise, strike them again in these hostile lands? That, dear reader, is where we leave our heroes this time. Until next time, keep your courage bright and your spirits undimmed. This tale is only just beginning to heat up. This was the recap for episode 27 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I am Count Bear, your Vim recap narrator. If you'd like to join us as Vim The Tale of Immortality premieres, tune in on Sunday at 5 p.m. UTC on youtube.com slash at Dicelvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. And remember, every subscribe keeps the magic alive. Thanks for sticking with us. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.